Dude, bud. Now on its own, this new L2 a taser laser system looks pretty cool. I mean, just check out this laser head. But there's one thing on this that gets me pretty darn excited. So normal laser scanners and laser engravers, you got your X and Y stage, right? You can do that. This one has the Z axis. So this laser head, let me show you over here, actually goes up and down and it's actuated within the software. So you can control the height. One, it does an autofocus, which is really nice, but then you can also control the cutting depth on each pass. So if you're doing multiple passes, you can sink that laser head down a little bit to do a bit of a better cut. We're gonna do some testing to see how that works. But this got me thinking right away of another application, let me show you. Now look, this isn't the final result, but this is the general idea. Because I have the up and down motion now, the Z axis, maybe I could use this down the road here as a writing machine to test fountain pens. We'll see how that goes. I'll put that one in the job jar, but for now we'll go through, we're gonna do some cutting, some engraving, I have a cool little product we're gonna make here. Um, but I thought before we get into that, let me just talk to you a little bit about the overall assembly build quality. A few things I found. One, the instructions were fantastic, but there are a couple of things that weren't mentioned that I will go through with you to explain that will save you a bunch of headaches. To show you real quick what we got, we got a 36 watt diode laser head. We have an air assist and this thing's got some serious power. We have this chuck. This is the sweetest looking chuck I've ever seen on one of these. It even adjusts as well. So for those tumblers that you have that are have a taper, you can adjust this and tilt it up instead of having to put a shim underneath. So that headache is gone. And we also have your standard adjustable uh, roller set up here as well. So this does not come fully assembled. I have a different one, the Creality uh, Falcon 2. That thing was fully assembled. That was the easiest build I've ever done because there was no building to do. Although there was a problem that came up that I found out later on where I should have checked it. But this one here, you got your manual, has six different languages, English, German, uh, French, Italian, Spanish, and Russian. And it's very, very thorough. The instructions are fantastic. I used to have to write manuals, assembly manuals for uh, equipments like this that would help with design and the engineering and everything. So they are very, very, very thorough on here. They point out some extremely critical parts of the scanner. I'll go through that and show that to you visually. But my suggestion to you is go through this manual Follow it by the letter. It doesn't miss anything. It's well written. Now to show you how well this is thought out from assembly point of view, you follow the steps in the manual. Step one, two, three, you get the idea. Each step, if there's fasteners, they label the little baggies with which fasteners and the sizes as well, just so you don't miss uh, and mix things up. So that's really, really well thought out. Now two pieces of gear I really recommend you having when you go to assemble a system like this. One down here, a tape measure. The other one is a square. Ensuring the frame is completely square when you assemble it is just really paramount to this. It's going to cause a lot of problems and things will show up in your uh, your engraving and your cuts if you're not checking for that. So have one of those handy. Also have a tape so you can check diagonals to make sure those are the same numbers and all that stuff is just exactly square because that is a very, very critical part. The other critical part too is when you put on this cross member. So when you assemble this, they tell you that uh, there's some guides here. They need to be all the way down here at the bottom. You really need to have that all the way down at the bottom. This part has to be square to the frame as well, because think about it, if anything is out a little bit, your prints are gonna be out too. And I'll show you the very first print you should do with any laser cutter, laser engraver, the very first test print you should do, I'm gonna show you how to do that. Another thing here is when you assemble this, we've got four points. Now, three points define a plane. That's why we have a tripod. If you go to add another fourth point in there, it's not gonna line up unless it's adjustable. So these are on solid feet. So just by physics alone, um, it's gonna be off. But what you do is when you are assembling this, before you put the cross member on, I just got, I'll flash it on the screen here, but I just got a piece of board to go across on the frame and then I weighted it. I had some heavy sandbags. I just put those on top to put weight onto the frame. So all the fasteners here on the side weren't fully tightened yet. They were just a little bit unsnug. That way you weight the system down. You wanna have it so it's flat on the table and then you go ahead and snug your fasteners. I just assembled it how it was without doing that and it was out of whack. You do not want that because now your depth of cut is gonna change over your whole uh, cutting surface as well. So you need that everything to be flat and, uh, and square as well. So load the system, put a weight on top of it 
and then go ahead and snug up all your fasteners that make up the frame. And now it's a level and it's square and everything's gonna be working great. So the very first and most critical test you should do, just rip off a chunk of the box that your scanner comes in, place it underneath, and then let's draw up some squares. So all I got going on here is just a bunch of, well, in this case, rectangles, the piece of cardboard I tore off is like rectangles. We're just gonna cut all those and then we're gonna check to make sure they're all square. Now to do the test quickly, I'm gonna go max power and this thing actually does up to 900 millimeters per second, so this should be quick. The cool thing in the manual, they show you how to do all this stuff in Lightburn as well, but they show you there's a little macro you have to do so you can do the autofocus, which is really cool. So let's, let's just hit the go button, I'll show you the autofocus and we'll do our test. All you do now, you just take your square, go around and make sure everything is dead nuts. And if you've done a good job, everything is correct. You can also use your tape to check it as well. So we're past, we're not gonna have any issues. Everything's square, it's cutting great. Let's make something useful. The first thing I'm cutting isn't gonna be too special. It's just a circle. What it's gonna be used for, I have this uh, foam piece that I use to put my Yeti mic on to sit there, but I thought I should have a little wood backing. So I got some of this quarter inch plywood that I picked up from Home Depot. This is a goof piece. It already has my logo engraved on there. So I thought, perfect, let's, let's use that piece. Now what I am gonna do, I'm gonna cut it a little bit quicker. I'm gonna do multi-pass, three passes at 25 millimeters uh, per second, 100% power, but let me show you something else. So you go into the settings and now you got three passes, but you have this Z step per pass. What's gonna happen? going to do one pass, drop two millimeters, do another pass, drop another two millimeters with the final pass. So we'll cut deeper on each pass. I think this will look great. I had to play that little sound for you when it was doing the framing. It sounds super cool. Yeah, cut out that piece and uh, this will do perfect. I can just glue the foam I had on it already just to make things more secure. I thought we'd go for maximum beans here. They supply these little calipers, but we got a one inch piece of cedar. So I wanted to see, can we cut through this? It's 36 watt. I was able to do 19 millimeter, um, like pine with a 22 watt laser. So I thought, let's see what this can do. And apparently we just tested the flame detection. So, <laughs> Let's, let's just turn it off. There we go. Turn that off. Use the little panel. Away you go. And it did not turn out any better. I really gave it, and then I did multiple passes, and you can even see here it drops. It'll stop, and now it drops down. I think two millimeters I did between each pass. And uh, yeah, you can actually see legit flames starting to come out of there. Uh, so it ended up just being a pretty much a charred mess. So no one inch cedar with this laser so we might as well just go ahead and go back to safe mode and keep the that on there because it's there for a reason the terrible cut job that's just i'm asking it to do too much but yeah almost got through just not quite enough so we'll just stick to what uh, this laser can do now i'm uh, i'm doing up a, an item i showed a friend of mine that i did earlier this is a little puzzle with the alphabet and we uh, have kids the same age his little guy's going into kindergarten real quick too it's been helping my son with the alphabet. He likes puzzles, so thought we'd do this. You can monitor the progress over the little panel, which is nice. And we got this cool little puzzle that uh, my son's been enjoying. So I think his will too. You just cut out another piece and just glue it together for a backing board. I thought, let's try some wrenches. That might be a, a handy thing is, you know, if you are a mechanic and you got a $40,000 tool chest, have your initials or something on there. So I tried it on this uh, spanner here. It's got a bit of a matte finish to it, you know, not a proper polished finish. So I just scuffed it a bit there with the scotch Brite afterwards. Came out fairly dark, so I thought, let's try a polished wrench. And we got nothing. You just got me with my cool goggles on. So it didn't get through there. So it was a little trick I thought of trying. Now you can get special paints, but let's just do it on the cheap really quick. Get a candle and get some soot on the wrench. You need it to absorb energy. So that there was, I gotta, you gotta do it on the side. Trying to do it for the camera wasn't working, but just hold it on the side so the soot goes up. Now it can absorb the energy from the laser. We got like a matte black there. I thought, let's see how this works. So ran the same file again. Took a, you know, I don't know, whatever it was, a minute or two. And now we got something. It's not perfect, 
you know, we're getting essentially rid of the first layer of the chrome on the top there. So it's not too bad. Uh, and then I thought, well, let's do something with this lighter. I was a little scared of what settings to use because I don't want it to get too hot. And maybe the sucker explodes. I, you know, I don't want that to happen. But went through, put an engraving pattern on here. And we got a cool little dragon I did. That's how it comes out of the laser. You just kind of wash it off, clean it up a little bit. That turned out not too bad. Then I thought, well, let's let's try out the fine mode because you can go fast, standard, or fine. I've been just doing standard. And let's do it on the other side. And let's see how this looks. Pretty decent indeed. So I'm, I'm happy with that. I think that looks pretty sharp on that laser now. Now, I wanted to play a little bit more with the whole fast, medium, and fine uh, settings you have on the machine. So what I did is I did an engraving with the fine setting. Overall, this took like 18 minutes, I believe, from start to finish to do it this way. Then I went back into the system, went to the fast, because I've done standard already, was happy with that. Thought I'd do the same thing with the fast, curious what the quality was like. This only took about six minutes to do. Thought I would come into the office here so we can get better lighting. And I can go over this a little bit better with you. Don't mind the shadow. That was me when I copied it over to duplicate it so I could do the fine detail. And the fast, I shifted it anyways. That's the operator error, not the machine. But this here we're looking at, this is the fine. And so this took a total, it was about 18 minutes to run. So it took quite a good length of time. It is nice and clean. This is the fast mode. And this was about six minutes to run. And like you could see the edges there are a touch more jagged. But overall, like it saves a lot of time. It's still a pretty good job, right? Just those edges and some of it's a little bit better. The surface finish is just a touch better here. But I mean, on that fast mode, it's pretty darn close. But what I do find is you actually get, the, I think the biggest contributing factor is actually when you're doing uh, the wood is wood grain. There's another piece of cedar that I, uh, I tried. This was just on regular mode. And you can see because there's not much grain uh, in this upper part, just look how clean that is. Let me zoom in here for you. Really, really clean, nice and smooth, great overall finish. You do get some interesting features when you have the grain running through it. That'd probably come out really nice in a stain. But what I did is I took advantage of the Z axis here. And I think you can probably see if we really get in close. Okay, there we go. You can see that extra little line that little extra ridge around there what i did i did two passes and on the second pass i sunk it down about an extra half a millimeter and so that uh those finishing passes were done after the engraving at like max speed uh so with like 900 millimeters per second 100 percent power and i found what that does is it uh it really cleans up the edges so you do the one but then you go a touch deeper so it's going to uh, engrave below the main surface engraving and it kind of just cleans up those edges. So taking advantage of the Z-axis and you don't always have to go to the super fine mode to get really good results. You can just do something like that. We're going to leave it there for now. I forgot to mention here on the Air Assist box, it's just how satisfying this little knob is. The click on this is just absolutely perfection. So it's adjustable here how much airflow is going to go through to the Air Assist. You can also turn it on, enable, disable through the software in Lightburn as well. The Z axis is pretty cool. I'm still trying to figure out the utility of it and how to do it. You can manually focus with your wheel here on top and there's a little spacer they provide or you can do the autofocus. That's quite nice. I thought that dropping the laser head down, let's say one or two millimeters, you can do multiple passes on a thick material would help you get through the thicker stuff. It doesn't seem to be doing that, but it does help to really clean up your engravings on like some finishing passes, doing a one finishing pass, and then dropping it like a half millimeter like I did. It just made the uh, the features and the edges a lot more crisp. So uh, I'm, you know, I'm playing around seeing how I can use that and, and uh, the, the benefits other than just the autofocus, which is quite cool. Some other things I thought were neat, the detachable interface here, so you don't always have to have it connected to your computer. You can just run this thing aut autonomously. If you've got someone you're gonna, whether it's yourself or someone else you're paying to do it or just a kid or something like that, and you're running a bunch of jobs, you don't have to have the computer tied up the whole time. So that's nice, you got your menu, you can run your jobs, change your settings, all that sort of stuff. Uh, it connects three ways, I forgot to mention that, through the G-code that you can save on your USB. 
the USB cable directly to the PC and underneath there is a Wi-Fi antenna, I forgot to mention that as well, so you can connect all those different ways. We have the framing laser, which is good to let you know where it is. It's adjustable, so either in the, uh, the front panel here or you can make a macro, if it's off a little bit from where you want, you can adjust the offset of where that is. So you frame it here and the laser point's gonna go to the same spot. So that's an option as well. So there's a lot of thought that went into it, even just from an assembly point of view, the packaging, all that stuff. Um, I'm, I'm really digging what they've done here with this uh, Etaser L2 system. One thing I wish they did change was the feet. These are quite wide. Uh, I don't think they need to be so wide, just a standard foot that would be here because it does take up some extra table space. So if you're trying to slip in big pieces of wood, now it does, you know, you're losing an extra, I don't know, maybe two inches, two and a half, maybe even three inches aside. So we got rid of that material, just had the foot that you need. Uh, you got, you know, three inches more per side of clearance for fitting in bigger pieces, especially like wood and stuff like that. So I think just a basic foot would be better. Uh, you don't need that much of a footprint. Like I said, they got you covered with the instructions. Follow them very closely and you'll do great, but also load the system. Put some weight on it when you're snugging everything down. That'll keep it all so it's not going to, you know, be out of whack for you there as well. And check it with a square. Do that stuff and then print the squares. Use the box if you want. Do that before you start doing cool stuff. The temptation is to fire the laser on something and have an awesome engraving right away. Just delay that a couple minutes. Do those steps, you will avoid all the problems. So thanks again to Taser for sending me the system to review and share with everyone here. Of course, links will be down there in the description. Check out their site for all the details. And uh, who knows, maybe I'll be strapping a pen to this one day soon and making a writing machine out of it. I don't know. If that doesn't work, I have another idea on how to do it. So actually, I ordered some actuators, um, some solenoids, just different ideas on how I can do this. We'll see what turns out if I can turn this into a writing machine as well. We'll have some fun. I'll hit up the rotary system and we'll catch you next time.